Hello again, Physics 30s. In today's lesson, we are going to wrap up the modern physics unit of study by talking about a relatively complicated topic dealing with wavelengths of matter. And our learning outcomes are to one, explain qualitatively how electron diffraction provides experimental support for the de Broglie hypothesis. And two, describe qualitatively how the two slit electron interference experiment shows that quantum systems like photons and electrons may be modeled as particles or waves contrary to intuition. So just like usual, we're going to start off by talking about another important scientist, this time around Louis de Broglie. And we're looking at 1924, which is now well beyond Max Planck's quantum hypothesis and after the Bohr model of the atom as well. And what de Broglie wondered is that if subatomic particles, for example, an electron, could exhibit wave-like properties. Now, I just want to clarify what the wave-like properties and the particle-like properties are. So when we talk about wave-like properties, there's two things that come to mind. One is waves can diffract. And diffract means that when a wave approaches either like a tiny slit or around a sharp edge, it spreads out. And two is waves can interfere. So if waves meet in phase, they constructively interfere to give you a larger amplitude wave. And if they meet out of phase, they destructively interfere to give you uh, a lower amplitude wave. The other important wave characteristic would be polarization. We're not going to really focus on that right now. I mean, polarization is just you, you reduce the plane in which the, the, the light can vibrate in. If we're talking about light. Okay, now my particle characteristics. I would say that we have two things. I would say when you view a particle, you need to view it as being a discrete unit. And two, particles can have momentum. So let's take one example. So let's take light. So light. can definitely diffract and interfere. That was the whole emphasis of Thomas Young's double slit experiment. It shows that when you pass light through a double slit, it diffracts, spreads out, and then the overlapping light can constructively interfere to give you antinodes and destructively interfere to give you nodes. However, it turns out that light also has particle-like properties. And the particle-like properties are that in order to explain the black body radiation curve and the photoelectric effect and the Compton effect, we have to view light as being your little tiny photons, your little bullets of light that have momentum, they're discrete, and they can diffract and they can interfere. So light has a particle-like property. So what de Broglie is wondering is the symmetry in nature. He's wondering if you can take a particle, so particle, a discrete unit like an electron, and... Can you go in the reverse direction? Is it possible for an electron to diffract, which means it'd have to spread out through a slit and then in some capacity interfere? That doesn't seem very likely, but we're gonna examine this anyways. Okay, his hypothesis is basically that if something has momentum, then it must have a corresponding wavelength. And I suppose a justification for that is because light, which has a wavelength, also has momentum, then an electron, which has momentum, technically should, according to the symmetry in nature, have a wavelength. And we can actually derive a really simple equation to calculate this. So for a particle, our equation for the magnitude of my momentum is mass times your speed. So P is M times V. For a photon, we know that the momentum, we derived this in a previous lesson, is H divided by the wavelength. And 
we also know that really only uh, photons of light that are towards the upper frequency part of the electromagnetic spectrum, like x-rays, they have like, I wouldn't even say like noticeable momentum, but at least some enough to cause an, a collision with an electron. And the reason they do that is because x-rays have a really small wavelength. If they have a small wavelength, it means they have more momentum. If I take these two equations, I can set them equal to each other. So I have equation one equals equation two, and then I have mv is equal to h over lambda. If we manipulate the equation for lambda, we then have a quantity that is referred to as the de Broglie wavelength. So we have h over mv is equal to lambda. So what this equation can be used to do is if you take the mass of a particle, like an electron, and you take its speed, you should be able to calculate a corresponding wavelength to it. Again, this seems like absolutely ludicrous. Like how can an electron, which is just a discrete particle, have a wavelength? Now let's suppose this equation is actually true. So should you be concerned? I, I suppose that like you, like a human being, you, you'd classify yourself probably as being a particle. Like you you're a discrete unit compared to other people and you definitely have momentum if you are moving. So does that mean that you have a wavelength? Should you be concerned about going through a tiny opening and suddenly just spreading into a bunch of little tiny U's? Or if you ran into another person, are you going to just simultaneously combine at them to give like a, a giant person? Well, no. But as cool as that would be, no, this is impossible. And here's why. Okay, so the issue is if we look at particles that have large masses, they will have wavelengths that are just way too small. And there, there's nothing you could find in nature that would ever allow for diffraction or interference. Okay, so let's take a couple examples of this. So I'll take a small object, like a one kilogram ball, and we'll say it's moving at a relatively fast speed, which is 10.0 meters per second. If you plug that into that equation, so that de Broglie wavelength equation tells me that lambda is equal to h over mv. If you plug these numbers into the equation, you get a wavelength of 6.63 times 10 to the negative 35 meters. That exponent is ridiculously small. In order to actually cause diffraction, you would need a slit that has a spacing that is smaller than that. Okay, you're not going to find that anywhere. Like our double slit experiment had like maybe like 10 to the negative four meters for our slit size. Uh, diffraction gratings can get to like 10 to the negative six, maybe 10 to the negative seven meters. So there's not a chance. Okay, so you, you don't need to worry about if you step through a door, if you're going to like suddenly spread into a bunch of like individual U's, if that makes any sense at all. The reason being, look at the equation here. There's an inverse relationship between lambda and the mass, which means that if you look at like really, really big objects, really big objects would have ridiculously tiny wavelengths. And I didn't even take a big object. I took a one kilogram ball and it has a really, really small wavelength. So if you want to calculate your personal wavelength, like take your mass in kilograms and then, I don't know, just walk at like maybe like a slow constant speed of like two meters per second and... I suspect that your wavelength would be even tinier than that ridiculously small ex exponent. However, if we take a subatomic particle like an electron, uh, and in electrons, they can move really fast, okay? Subatomic particles, small mass, easy to get them to accelerate and move quickly. They have a wavelength that's in the 10 to the negative 9 meter range. Now, that's still not, uh, that, that's still too small even for a diffraction grating to cause diffraction. If you fire an electron through a diffraction grating, uh, the, the size of the diffraction grating is, is it's just too big. Okay, so nothing's going to happen. So what we really need to do is we need to find some kind of diffraction grating that would have a size of its opening that's a little bit tinier than that. So along come Davison and Germer, and they perform an experiment. I guess they performed over five years. Uh, that's going to support the de Broglie hypothesis. So what they did is they supported this hypothesis experimentally by firing electrons through a nickel crystal. 
Now, if you're wondering why would I use a nickel crystal, it turns out a nickel crystal, uh, if you look at the spacing between, uh, I want to say like, what did I refer to that as here? Yeah, the array of atoms in a nickel crystal. So if you take like a couple of these circles here, okay, so that's like my crystal structure in terms of the atom that make up nickel. And if you measure the distance between these two guys, it would give you a really, really, it's a really small distance. I said three angstroms right here. An angstrom has a distance that is, one angstrom is 10 to the negative 10 meters. So it turns out that nickel, the nickel crystal actually has a natural diffraction grating that is small enough. Like 10 to the negative 10 is a number that's smaller than the 10 to the negative nine for an electron. So I seem to have a diffraction grating criteria that should allow for the diffraction to occur. And it turns out when you fire electrons and do this, you do in fact get an interference pattern, which seems very, very strange. Now let's draw a comparison between what this would look like for an X-ray compared to what this would look like for an electron. Okay, so an X-ray, that's a form of light. Okay, so that would be light, visible light, not visible light, sorry, it's an invisible light and that would be a wave. I was gonna focus on a couple of these rings here. So I have like a ring that kind of surrounds this pattern. Okay, so let's focus on just a couple of these right here. Now the bright spots on this pattern would be like, uh, again, you need some kind of other device to measure like uh, where uh, you're actually getting the intensity of these photons to line up. But the, the quote unquote bright spots would be an area where you'd have constructive interference and the dark spots in the middle would be destructive interference. Now, if you fire electrons through this nickel crystal, you can also get an interference pattern. It just looks a little bit different. So let's focus on these two outer rings. The big difference between like the interference pattern for light compared to an electron, and again, an electron is a particle, is that the interference pattern isn't continuous. So right here, this is like kind of like a solid line, a solid continuous line at like my particular antinode, it's continuous. If you look at one of these rings surrounding this here, they look like there's like, there's some breakage between the different points. So if I kind of like went around, I could use like a dashed line to represent it. And so that's not continuous. It almost looks like the interference pattern is a little bit discrete. Like there's like space in between these different spots. So maybe I'll call it discrete or non-continuous at least. Which maybe I would expect because an electron is a discrete particle. So maybe the interference of patterns it forms is not continuous. It has like little spaces between them. It's a discrete type pattern. So maybe this isn't so bad after all. Well, it is bad after all. Let's, see, let's, let's kind of talk about what's actually going on here. Okay, so now it turns out that because uh, de Broglie suggested that an electron has a wave-like property to it, we have to modify our model of the atom. Because in our previous model of the atom, we talked about how we had electrons in these stationary states. So now we need to make a revised model where we account for the wavelength of an electron. So what de Broglie then did is he applied the wave nature of an electron to an electron orbiting around a hydrogen nucleus. Again, we'll just stick around with hydrogen because it's the, the simplest atom that you can actually look at. And what he predicted is that the electron is going to act like a standing wave spread out over a circular orbit of radius r. Okay, there's a lot of stuff in that statement. So let's try to just deal with it like one point at a time. Okay, first things first, I don't know if you recall what a standing wave is from physics 20, but I'll quickly give you a quick refresher about that. So let's go to, uh, whoops. Uh, okay, so let's go to this. Okay, so this is just a string that's attached to like a fixed boundary. So 
let's just start this. So like someone flicks the string, gets a wave pulse that's going. And what we're going to do is we're going to observe what happens when this wave pulse is going to hit that fixed boundary on the right side. So it's kind of like there's a string and it's just like it's locked in place at this point here. I wish there was a way I could speed this up. I can't. Okay, so I have this wave that's approaching. So I have a uh, wave, instant wave with a particular wavelength and amplitude that is going to approach this wall. Okay, I'm going to stop it right here and just pause for a moment. Now, you're going to see it in a second. A second wave is going to appear. Okay, when this wave energy hits the wall, some of it's going to get reflected and it's going to bounce back. Okay, it's going to appear blue in color. So what I want to point out is when the wave energy gets reflected backwards, and again, this is something we talk about in physics 20, when a wave pulse hits a fixed boundary, the reflected wave pulse is going to be inverted. It's going to be upside down. The reason being is because the, the wave pulse, the instant one, exerts a force upward on the fixed boundary. The fixed boundary exerts an equal and opposite force on the wave pulse, thereby inverting it. So it's just an application of Newton's third law of motion. Okay, so now what I'm going to see is I'm going to see both the red wave. So someone is continuing to generate this wave from the left-hand side. And I'm also seeing the blue wave that is now going towards the left-hand side. What I've now done is I've created the condition for a standing wave. So the way you produce a standing wave is if you have two waves with the same amplitude, okay, so they have the same height and the same wavelength, and the distance from crest to crest would be constant, two waves, same wavelength, same amplitude, approach each other in opposite directions, that is going to lead to something called a standing wave. Okay, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click another button, and what that's going to do is it's going to superimpose these waves. So it's going to show you what the uh, addition of their amplitudes are at like a given point in time. Okay, let's click it. Now, I'm going to pick a couple of spots right here just to like point some things out. So let's pick right here. Okay, at this point, what happens is the waves, the instant wave and the reflected wave, they meet perfectly in phase. When they meet perfectly in phase, there's perfect constructive interference that occurs. So the black wave here would actually be the superimposed one. So if I take away uh, the reflected and instant one for a moment, okay, then I have a maximum crest here and a maximum trough there. I'm also going to focus on what happens when they're out of phase. We'll stop at about right here. Okay, I couldn't quite get it to the right spot, but then I have a crest meets a trough, and then you get destructive interference. Now, because I've shown the condition necessary to get this, I'm gonna I'm just gonna take away the instant wave and I'm gonna take away the reflected wave. And now what we have is a standing wave. What a standing wave is, is if you look at this, you have a bunch of stationary points that are called nodes. So a node is a point where there is no vibration of your particles whatsoever. Okay. So nothing is vibrating at those points. Halfway in between the nodes, you have an anti-node where you have like the wave that continuously oscillates just from a crest to a trough. And it goes to a crest all the way to a trough. And if you look at any of them, uh, between any two consecutive nodes, you're always gonna have an anti-node that just keeps flipping back and forth between, uh, between a trough and between a crest. Okay, so now that we've reviewed what a standing wave is, let's go back to the PowerPoint and try to like figure out what's happening here. Okay, so you said that an electron acts like a standing wave spread out over a circular orbit of radius r. Okay, here's how we'd have to actually we have to form it. So imagine you have like a you have like a wire where you actually have the standing wave on it. So you have like a wire, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue to bend this wire. I'm gonna keep to continue to bend it, bend it and bend it until I can form like a nice complete circle. So what we're doing then is in a particular orbit, uh, we've essentially taken that, the electron is behaving like a standing wave. And if I take that orbit, or if I take this line and just bend it into the shape of an orbit, then uh, the electron behaves like a standing wave in that particular orbit. Now, you are probably immediately wondering what what is the electron doing here? Like, okay, it's in this orbit, okay, it's behaving like a standing wave, but like, what is it actually doing? So here's usually a couple of like suggestions that students give to me, and I'll, I'll kind of mention a few of them. You can, you can see like which ones that, uh, that have come to mind for you. 
In fact, even before I do this, I, I just like question like, okay, I have a standing wave pattern. That's great. But what is an electron in that orbit actually doing? Okay. One suggestion is an electron is just following the shape of the standing wave. So what it's doing is you have an electron here. It would just be following. It'd like go up to a crest, go down to a trough, up to a crest, down to a trough, up to a crest, down to a trough. And it just kind of follows this little path here. Okay. It's not really what a stand, how a standing wave actually works. So Another suggestion that students often give to me here is they just say what the electron is doing is the electron is like vibrating in accordance with the standing wave. So what it'd be doing is the electron starts here, it'd be like vibrating about the orbit. So it vibrates more at a crest and a trough, then it stops, stops vibrating. It keeps moving and then it starts vibrating a bit more and then it stops vibrating for an instant. And you get over here, it starts vibrating a lot more and then it stops vibrating. That one seems pretty plausible, okay? So like as the electron's moving it around, it's just vibrating in accordance with the amplitude of the standing wave. Well, that's also wrong. So what is the electron actually doing? What is my little discrete unit, an electron doing in this standing wave orbit? You are not gonna like this. <laughs> There's actually two ways we can explain it. So what is the electron doing in this orbit this entire standing wave is the electron so the electron is here the electron is here the electron is here and the electron is there all at the same point in time now th this seems crazy because like an electron is like what it's like a dot right it's like a little tiny particle that occupies a really, really small volume. So how can it be spread out over this entire circular orbit? But I'm telling you, this is actually true. Or according to like our current model, the atom, like th this is, this is true. The entire electron is covering this entire space. Okay. If you still don't like that, I'm going to give you an alternate explanation to it in a moment, but that's viewing it as a wave. So we're starting to think of an electron as a wave that's continuous and spread out through that actual orbit. So that the entire standing wave is the electron, which again is very, very counterintuitive and very confusing. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this though. So note one, an electron wave that closes on itself will constructively interfere to produce a stable standing wave. Okay, what this basically means is that if you start the wave here, and let's go around the, let, let, let's, let's trace like how many wavelengths we have around the circle. So we can go around like one. So that'd be one wavelength. And let's change it to a different color and go around even more. This would be your second wavelength. We can go around one up more time. Keep following up to my crest, down to my trough, the wave starts to repeat. And then this would be your third wavelength. So from start to finish, so you start at this point and you come back to this point. So this is both your start, starting point, and this is your end point. From start to finish, if you can fit a whole number multiple of wavelengths into that distance of the orbit, then you're going to have constructive interference occur, and that's going to give you a stable standing wave. Okay, so that's all it means here. To get uh, a stable standing wave, you need constructive interference to occur. For constructive interference to occur, you need to have a whole number multiple of waves fit into the actual uh, fit into this radius here. More specifically, we need to get have it fit into the circumference. So the circumference is just the distance around kind of like the outer perimeter of like the circle. So you get constructive interference only when a whole number multiple of wavelengths, that's n times lambda, can fit in this circular orbit. And fit in the circular orbit is specifically fit within the circumference of the orbit. Circumference of a circle is pi times the diameter or two pi times r. So as long as we can meet that condition, we do have a stable standing wave. 
Now, I'll talk about this in a moment in terms of this actually does explain why there are only discrete energy levels, not in between ones. But let's look at the equation first. Okay, so to get a stable standing wave, so your electrons spread out throughout the entire orbit, your circumference, which is 2 pi r, so that's c, is 2 pi r, you need to fit a whole number multiple of wavelengths into sort of that circumference. You have 2 pi r equals n times lambda. n in this equation represents the number of wavelengths at the nth stationary state. So the diagram I showed, I showed that from in, over the circumference of the, the circle, you can actually fit three wavelengths in there. So this illustration would actually be uh, an illustration of the electron at the third stationary state. Okay, and I'll, I'll go to an animation in a moment to show you a bit more about this. Now I'm gonna take the de Broglie wavelength equation and plug it in where you have lambda is equal to h divided by m times v. And then we're gonna expand the equation a little bit. So we have two pi r is equal to n and then h over mv. And then I'm going to manipulate it for MVR, and I have MVR is equal to N and then H divided by 2 pi. Now, if you do take this equation, and if you isolate for R, so I'll just pull it up here. If you take that equation for R, manipulated it, it would be R is equal to NH divided by 2 pi mv. Let's just double check that. R is nh over 2 pi nv. Now it turns out if you plug in n equals 1 and all the other numbers, so n equals 1 would be the ground state or the first stationary state. If you plug this in uh, and Planck's constant, 2 pi, you plug in the mass of an electron and its speed of an electron, not totally clear how you would know at that speed. But let's say you know all these variables, you would actually get the radius for the first stationary state for hydrogen, which I think is something around like 5.29 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. If you plugged in n equals 2, you would get the, the radius for the second stationary state. If you plug in n equals 3, you get the radius for the third stationary state. So the actual de Broglie hypothesis does support Bohr's model of the atom. So it all does come together if you actually do plug numbers in and confirm it. Now, I kind of want to show you a more like dynamic picture to like see like what's going on at the standing wave. So I'll come back to this in a moment. So let's go to my second animation here. Okay, so this is an illustration of all our different models of, and we're just going to use the hydrogen atom. So the, the most simple model tells us that all matter is made up of the smallest particle called an atom, and that's John Dalton's billiard ball model. So you just have like a single ball here. And what I'm doing is I'm firing a bunch of uh, photons of light at it. So photons of like varying colors. And it seems like all that's happening right here is the photons of light hit the, hit the, the, the atom and just bounce off. Okay. Then JJ Thompson comes around and he does the cathode ray tube experiment, which shows that there, there actually are positive and negative charges in here. So in this, I have my gaseous cloud of positive charge. And within that gas cloud of positive charge, I have an electron that would offset that positive charge. And again, I'm firing a bunch of uh, photons of light into this, uh, into this atom. And all I can see that happens right here is like when a photon hits the electron, it looks like it's just simply getting absorbed. And then and it absorbs energy and just moves around. Okay, let's look at the solar system model. So that this is going to be now... Uh, so Rutherford comes along and he does a scattering experiment, which shows us that uh, you need to have the positive charge concentrated in the nucleus. So our solar system model is like this. So we'd have like our very tiny, densely packed nucleus with a proton in it. However, the problem with this model is that the electron is in circular orbit. It's undergoing centripetal acceleration. Therefore, it's emitting EMR. It'll spiral into the nucleus and boom, okay, blows up and we wouldn't have an atom. So that can't possibly be the correct model. Now let's go to the Bohr model of the atom. Now the Bohr model of the atom still doesn't explain like why 
because the Bohr model says, yes, your electrons move in a circular orbit, but uh, they just don't radiate EMR for reasons why. I don't know. Who knows why? Okay, let's see what happens here. So right now we have an electron that's just hanging out in the low energy ground state. And we need to wait for a photon to actually hit it for something to occur. Come on, hit it. This has got to hit it. Are you, are you kidding? How about this one? This looks pretty direct. I'm going to make you sit here and watch this video until we actually... Oh, here we go. Where did it go to? Okay, so this time it absorbed a photon. And again, the, the thing with a photon is that uh, in order to jump to a higher energy level, it has to absorb a photon with that exact amount of energy. So what it did right here is it absorbed a photon. And now I can see it in the... Here's the first stationary state, second, third. It looks like in the, it's in the fourth one, okay? So my electron is in the fourth stationary state. It's moving in my circular orbit. But again, your electrons are lazy. They want to go back down to the ground state, and eventually it will, okay? Oh, it made an intermediate jump here. So it jumped down to n equals 3. And it, it should have emitted a photon. I think it emitted this red one, this red one that jumped away, which makes sense. If you go down just a, a small jump, you emit a low-energy photon. Okay, you're going to jump down again, electron. Oh, yeah, this one time it went from n equals 3 to n equals 1. It, it got a little more brave. It, it decided it could make the, the entire plunge down to the ground state. Okay, what kind of a photon does it emit this time? I didn't see it. How about we speed it up and see if we can see what it does? Where is it? Okay, go to a high energy state. No. Where are you? Here we are. It's over here. Let's slow it down and see if we can see it emit a photon. Because when it jumps back down, whatever energy gain, it's got to give up. Okay, go back down. Did it emit it? I think it emitted it right here. It, so, like, it, it just uh, it jumped down instantaneously. It emitted a photon. And that photon is being shot over to that side. And it was a violet one, which is not surprising because a bigger jump is going to result in a higher energy photon due to the larger difference in the energy levels. Okay, now let's step it up to the De Broglie one. Okay, so in the De Broglie model, the atom, this is my standing wave. Oh my goodness. This time around, it went to the uh, higher state quicker than I wanted it to. I don't want it to do it. Okay, stop. Go back to your underground state. Okay, so what this is showing is that the electron itself is this entire wave. So this electron is just vibrating around the circular orbit like a standing wave. And in this orbit right here, I think it's hard to see, but I believe in the first stationary state, you should only have one wavelength that fits in there. Now, when it absorbs a photon and goes to a higher one, Okay, so this time we went to the second stationary state. So we should be able to count two wavelengths in here. So if I start here, it'd be like one. And I think we have two. Yeah, we have two wavelengths that fit in the second stationary state. And if we go to a higher one, I think we can get uh, more wavelengths that fit in. Okay, go to a big one. There we go. Yeah, so this one would be the one, two, three, four, five, fifth stationary state. So we should be able to count five wavelengths in here. So like one two, three, four, five. Okay, so according to the de Broglie hypothesis, the electron is this entire standing wave. Now, this, per, this can perhaps address the question, well, why doesn't an electron in orbit emit EMR? Well, how would you describe the motion of the electron here? Is it moving in with centripetal acceleration? I don't know what it's doing. Like the electron is like this entire wave spread over the region, but maybe perhaps we could say that it's not accelerating in the sense of like an electron in circular orbit. So maybe because it's behaving like a wave and not really accelerating in the same sense as like how a particle would accelerate, perhaps that might be enough of an explanation to identify why it does not emit EMR. But just, I think there's a much more complicated explanation for that. But I would just say right now, the way we get around the uh, spiraling problem with an accelerating electron emitting EMR is we just don't view the electron as a discrete unit. We view it as like a continuous wave and the continuous wave, who knows like if it's actually accelerating or not.
it just it just spread out like a standing wave. Now, if you don't like this idea that the electron, which is a discrete unit, can be spread out over an entire like orbit, there is a different way we can look at it. Okay, and it involves probability. Okay, so this is a Greek letter, which I think is psi. So it says, if psi represents the amplitude of, an ele of the electron wave, then the amplitude squared at a given position in time represents the probability of finding the electron at that given position in time. Okay, here's what this means. Again, I'm going to draw just a red line to show like what the normal circular orbit is. The normal circular orbit would be like where the standing wave is at rest. Okay, if we look at this right here, so there's a bunch of positions throughout the standing wave. Again, the standing wave oscillates about a bunch of positions called a node. Now, at the position of a node, what's the amplitude of your wave? Your amplitude would be equal to zero. So what would the probability of finding the electron in that? So we can still view the electron as being in the orbit. What would be the probability of finding the electron at that point in the orbit? It'd be zero. So at a point on the orbit where you have a node, uh, that would be a point where there, the probability of finding an electron at that point is nothing. Okay. Now, if you compare it to an anti-node, So an antinode is where you'd have your amplitude is a maximum. So an antinode represent the probability, the, the most likely probability of finding an electron in that point. So I suppose if you wanted to, we could go back to thinking, uh, if you don't like the fact that the electron is spread out through the entire orbit, we could also just think of it as, here's my electron, a single discrete unit is gonna move around the circle. And if we want to try to find it, the standing wave represents the probability of finding it at a given point in time. Here's the funky thing about this. This is where it gets like, it starts to get super weird. Like this opens like a whole can of worms in terms of like just, just quantum weirdness. So you might say to me, okay, well, if the, if the electron exists here and it exists here, all at the exact same point in time why don't we just test that like why don't we do something to see if it actually exists at this point at two points at once so maybe what we can do is we can fire a gamma ray in here and if it hits the electron and bounces back i know it exists there and if i fire a gamma ray at the same time it hits the electron wave and bounces back i would know it exists both at point one and point two at the same time the thing is, though, as soon as you try to do this, where you try to like prove, well, does the electron exist at two points at once? The instant you do this, the electron actually behaves differently. What it'll do then is it'll start to just behave like instead of existing at two points at once. If you try to find it, it'll start to behave like just a single electron moving around a circle. So it's weird. It's like in our effort to prove that an electron is a spread out wave, somehow our interference in what the electron is doing makes it behave just like a regular old discrete particle again. So like I said, there's some like serious quantum weirdness that's going on here. I'm going to make a reference to a YouTube video you can watch at the very end of this lesson that kind of summarizes this. But let's talk about a couple other things first. Okay, so let's come back to the double slit experiment. So this time around, we're going to look at firing electrons through the, uh, the double slit. Okay, although we're going to have to use the the nickel atom uh, crystal just because we have that natural diffraction grating in there. Okay, so let's look at the situation where uh, let's say we have a double slit experiment. So du traditional double slit experiment would be you have your little wall here and you have like your tiny slits and what i'm going to do is i'm going to fire a beam of electrons through these slits at the same time so i'm going to fire like a ton of electrons it's not just one just fire like a huge amount of electrons 
through these little tiny holes, okay? Let's see what happens. When we do this, we get a pattern of alternating dark and bright fringes. Now, it's not going to look like what you'd expect for Young's experiment, okay? This is what the interference pattern would look like for uh, electron diffraction and interference. Now, when you look at this here, there are no clear spots where you have nothing, okay? Or like there, there's, no, there's, there's no electrons at a certain point. But what I can observe here is there are spots. So the whiter the picture appears, that means that's, a, that's an area where you have more electrons accumulating. So in the regions where you have like more electrons accumulating, so I'm going to highlight them. So it looks like this area, they're accumulating. It looks like this area here, they're also accumulating. And it looks like this area here is accumulating. An area where you have a higher probability of electrons uh, accumulating, that is what we call an antinode. Now, in the middle areas, and I'll just circle one, I'll highlight one of them. So there's some areas where I have a little bit more of the black spots. The black spots mean that none of the electrons actually accumulated there. So let's focus on this little region. So this little region is what we call a node. A node would be an area where there is a lower probability of electrons gathering. So unlike shining light through the double slit, a node is like there's no light at all. For shining electrons through a node, it'd be just a lower probability of them actually accumulating. Okay, now, you might be wondering, well, how can an electron do this? Like, if you're firing electrons through, how can they actually, like, spread out over this entire area? Like, how can an electron end up right here? Or how can an electron end up right there? Shouldn't they just go through in straight lines so they behave like particles? Well, one explanation might be as these guys get fired through, like, maybe this guy gets fired at a bit of an angle. This guy gets fired at a bit of an angle. And maybe what happens is these two electrons, they hit each other and they repel. And just this random repulsion just causes them to like distribute throughout the actual screen. So maybe the interference pattern isn't so much due to diffraction as much as the electrons just hitting each other and repelling to positions on the screen. Well, let's try to be a bit more clever with this now. So let's try this. So let's go back to the double slit. And what we're going to do is because we want no chance of the electrons actually hitting each other and colliding, all we're going to do is we're going to fire an electron one at a time. So what I would do is I'd fire one electron, let it go through the slit. Okay, and then I'd, I'd record its position on the wall. So maybe like this electron hits this position. Then I fire a second electron. It hits somewhere on the wall, okay? So if I fire it one at a time, there's absolutely no way these two electrons can either repel or hit each other and move apart. So here's what happens. After 100 electrons, do you see an interference pattern? I don't. That looks like it's about like just a rough, uh, like an even distribution of electrons hitting like a dark screen. How about after 30,000 electrons. So it's after 30,000 electrons, it means you'd fire them, you'd alternate firing them through the slits one at a time. Do you see an interference pattern? Again, I don't. It looks like it's just roughly uh, an even distribution in the electron density. How about after doing this 70,000 times? Okay, now I'm starting to see it. Okay, so if I look at the screen here, I can now see these areas where I have a bit more accumulation compared to the other ones. So these areas where I have a bit more accumulation, that is what I would refer to as being an antinode. Okay, this makes reference to a principle. It's called quantum indeterminacy. Into, ugh, indeterminacy which states that the wave nature of particles is best understood as a measure of probability that the particles be found at a particular location. Okay, so we've already mentioned this in reference to what the standing wave represents. So if you look at the standing wave uh, of like a particular orbit around like an atom, 
where you have areas where you have antinodes, that means it's a higher probability of finding electrons there. So that's what we call a bright fringe. And then we also have lower probability areas where your the electrons are not going to accumulate. So in this case, this guy would be a bright fringe. And then directly in between the bright fringe, you have this region where there's just a little bit less accumulation. So there's slightly less probability of the electrons accumulating. And that's what we call a dark fringe. And this is where quantum physics gets really, really messed up. Like in classical physics, we like to be able to predict exactly as what is going to happen. Like if I alter this variable, where exactly is this particle going to end up? Quantum physics doesn't work like that. Like when I fire an electron through the double slits, there's no way I can predict where it is actually going to hit the screen. I have no clue. Okay. Like, uh, it, it could hit the screen like over here. It could hit it there. I have no clue where the next one is going to hit. However, if I repeat this over like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of trials, I can eventually start to see a pattern emerge. Okay. We just can't, we, we just can't make a prediction as to what is going to happen in the next scenario. Okay. Final one. This is where it's going to get, uh, this is really going to mess your brain. And then I'll show you, uh, a, a video afterwards that's probably going to just, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make reference to the video and you can watch it on your own. That's probably going to like break your brain in terms of physics. Okay. So this time around, what we're going to do is we are going to just take a single slit. So we're going to take a single slit and we're going to fire electrons through the single slit one at a time. Okay. Now, if you do this, if you just fire electrons through one slit, all that's going to happen is the electrons are just going to go in a nice straight line and they are just going to accumulate in a line directly on the screen. Okay. So they're going to accumulate right here. There's no interference pattern. If I just, if I just, uh, fire it through a single slit, what happens if I add a second slit? but I don't fire any electrons through it. So I'll put a second slit here, but I'm not going to do anything else differently. Okay. I'm just going to fire the electrons through add a second slit, uh, just to the side. Okay. Just for fun. I'm not going to fire the electrons through and I want to see what happens. Well, you get an interference pattern. <laughs> this seems really, really creepy. Okay. So, you fired these electrons through a single slit. You got like one line. You added a second slit, but you didn't actually fire any electrons through there. And you got your interference pattern where you're getting higher probability accumulation as your antinodes and lower probability accumulation as your nodes. So the question is like, how did the electron know there was another slit. You, you never even fired them through the adjacent second slit that you added. So something like really, really weird is going on here. And like I said, this is like where just quantum physics takes into like a, a different level where like it just becomes a mess. And when I say a mess, like uh, I, th I think we try to like always associate to uh, like our understanding of science principles, but like drawing analogies to things. Like, for example, a lot of our models of the atom, like we take like a solar system model, like something that we can draw an analogy to. For a lot of quantum physics, there is no analogy. Like, so you can't really visualize what's going on. It all comes down to like really, really complicated uh, mathematics that involves like horrible probability distributions. And it, it, it's, it, it's tough. Uh, I, I personally have never actually like gone beyond, I think I've done a little bit of like modern physics where we talk a little bit more about this, but even the most basic models to deal with this, like are still just an absolute nightmare mathematically to deal with. Okay. So there's an assignment you can complete that's called wavelengths of matter. Uh, however, I just want to point out one other thing. So there's a little video you can watch on YouTube. 
I, I can't actually play the video because the sound will, sound will be really warped out. What I would do is I'd go into YouTube and type in Dr. Quantum double slit experiment or just double slit. And you'll get this little cartoon from, I believe it's from a movie that was called What the Bleep Do We Know? And you'll see this like cartoon of like this, this dude who uh, is dressed up like a superhero. And it actually does a really nice job of summarizing like how particles and waves behave. And <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to talk about something else that's going to even like further mess with your head. So if you've already feel like your brain has been broken by this lesson, then maybe you should give yourself a break and go out for a walk and then come back and watch this at some point. Uh, but I do recommend watching this video. It's, it's actually like really, really interesting just to show like how weird quantum physics actually does get. Okay, so that's it for this lesson. And again, you can complete this assignment. And then I will talk to you again in the uh, next unit of study, which is the last one dealing with nuclear physics.